I, I know that we compete for your time and for your attention, so I don't take the fact that you're here for granted. I'm very grateful that you take this time to be here and that you take time out of your busy lives to come because your lives are very busy, I know that. And so, thank you for making the effort to be here. I hope that you are finding some nourishment here during uh, these um, times that we have spent together. And so, the notes for this week are there in the back, and the, there are other notes there as well. So if you'd like to take the notes and have them with you as we begin uh, this evening. If you have missed the other sessions that we have had, the other Bible study sessions, do not despair. Everything is online. If you go to the church's website, which is St. Joseph, S-T-Joseph, H-O-M dot org, there, there is a tab called Bible study. You click on that, and there you have the past Bible study sessions videotaped and you can watch them or there are handouts there as well the handouts the notes that you have been receiving in class are there so uh, those resources are there as well there's also other things that I have put on there very helpful Catholic websites including free Bible study courses that you can take that I Recommend And there's uh, a couple there that are not free. One of the ones that is uh, not free is called My Catholic Faith Delivered. I used it in the previous parish that I was at as an educational tool. I have taken the courses that are offered through there myself. They are excellent, excellent. Uh, and really, all the websites... And the links that are there on the website are for your spiritual development and spiritual nourishment. One of the websites that I highly recommend, particularly during this month, the month of the Holy Rosary, October is called the month of the Holy Rosary, the month dedicated to Our Lady, is called Come Pray the Rosary. It is a website that you can use to pray the rosary with people from around the world who are praying at the same time, that we can pray the rosary together. And this particular month, the month of the Holy Rosary, October, was proclaimed as such by Pope St. Pius V in the 16th century after the Battle of Lepanto in 1571, October 7th, 1571, which is why October 7th is the Feast of Our Lady of Victory. And the reason for that is at that time, Europe was being invaded by the Ottoman Empire, who were the Turks, they were Muslims, and they were trying to take over. And the Pope at that time, Pope St. Pius V, asked that everyone pray the rosary for the success of the defense of not just the freedom of the people at the time, but also the defense of the faith. And against all odds, the Christians were outnumbered. Against all odds, the Christians were victorious. And the Pope attributed the victory to the intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary and the praying of the Rosary. Today, as you know, the world is facing much of the same type of problems from extremist Islamic forces that want nothing more than to take over and to Im impose on us their will and their view of society and take away our freedoms what better way to battle 
than with the Holy Rosary to pray that we may be victorious against our enemies, the enemies of the faith and the enemies of freedom. We are very blessed to live in the United States of America. It's a wonderful country. I have had the opportunity to live in other places around the world, and there really is no better place than the great United States of America with the freedoms that we enjoy and that we cherish here. And so we ask Almighty God, through the intercession of our Blessed Mother, to help us as we continue to fight the enemies of freedom, the enemies of the United States, and the enemies of our faith. As we pray this evening, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Lord Jesus, we thank you for gathering us here this evening during the month of October, as we call to mind your victory over death, over darkness, that you've brought light into our lives, that you have come to heal our blindness, take away the scales from our eyes that are not allowing us to see that which is important, that which is not allowing us to see all that you wish for us to become in this life. We pray for the grace for our eyes to be opened, that you may come to heal our spiritual blindness. As we pray, our Father, who art in heaven, And we ask for our Blessed Mother's intercession as we say, Hail Mary, full of grace. And blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And so it's so good to be with all of you here this evening as we look at the readings for this coming Sunday. Yesterday, I had a very interesting day as I came into the office before the noon mass. There was somebody waiting there to see me, and the person came with a gift. And you know what their gift was? They brought me a deodorant. <laughs> they bought me a deodorant, and they sa I said, oh, well, thank you. <laughs> I was like this, thank you. <laughs> and they said, well, you know, I was in the store, and, it, and when I saw the deodorant, I thought of you. <laughs> Well, just to put all of you at ease, I did take my weekly shower this morning. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of people who take weekly showers whether they need it or not. <laughs> but the Lord showers us with great grace. The grace is that gift from the Lord to help us in this life. Help us to be servants to one another. And sometimes life deals us or presents to us tough situations. And in all of those situations, the way to react is always with great gentleness, patience. 
and humility. There could be a, different ways that you could react to a situation like that. Can you imagine if somebody came and gave you a, a deodorant? Or maybe a bar of Dove soap? Or <laughs> We used to do that when I was in the seminary. Uh, if somebody needed to get the message, well, at least we'd hope that they would get the message, that they had a hygiene issue, we would leave uh, by their door a bar of soap or some deodorant <laughs> with the hope that they would get the message. But so many times, many of the issues that come in our life are from the people in our life. How is it that we react? Do we react with patience, bearing with one another, with great gentleness and tenderness, all that may come our way, or do we overreact? It's always better to keep our mouth closed, and rather than saying something that we might regret, keeping it in, turning it over to God offering up any situation that might come our way that might make us uncomfortable. Offering it up. And as we look at these readings for this coming weekend, October 25th, let us keep that in mind. The great need for humility that the Lord is asking us to take on. To become humble as Jesus was. It is only in humility that we can accept that maybe we don't know everything and maybe we need to change. And as this coming weekend will show us, only in humility can we accept the fact that all of us are spiritually blind and that we need to be cured of our spiritual blindness whatever that blindness may be in our lives, that the Lord wants to heal that. And so let us look at the readings for this coming weekend. The first reading from the prophet Jeremiah. Please listen. Thus says the Lord, Shout with joy for Jacob. Exult at the head of the nations. Proclaim your praise and say, The Lord has delivered his people, the remnant of Israel. Behold, I will bring them back from the land of the north. I will gather them from the ends of the world, with the blind and the lame in their midst, the mothers and those with child. They shall return as an immense throng. They departed in tears but I will console them and guide them. I will lead them to brooks of water on a level road so that none shall stumble. For I am a father to Israel. Ephraim is my firstborn. The word of the Lord. And so let's look at the notes for this coming Sunday. The passage that we have just heard from the prophet Jeremiah is part of a series of four poems celebrating the return from the Babylonian exile of the chosen people of God. Exile is part of the continual history of the people of Israel. When the Bible talks about the people of Israel, it's talking about the chosen people of God. We are the new Israel. We are thus the chosen people of God. God has chosen each and every one of us. The most famous exile is the exile in Egypt, from which the people of Israel, the Hebrew people, were led out by Moses. Moses led them out from slavery into freedom, from the slavery of their oppressors, into the promised land. Over and over again, the Bible presents to us the people coming out of darkness, coming out of slavery into great freedom. The prophet has a preoccupation with the adjustment to life in exile. 
He's presenting here the fact that it is hard to live in exile. This life for us is in exile. We are exiled from our true homeland, heaven. Heaven is our true homeland. We are on the way to heaven. We are in exile. It's not easy, in other words. We may have returned from the life of slavery that we have had before. Jesus has freed us. And yet, life is still hard once we have returned from exile. The people, once they returned from Egypt, remember, they would complain over and over and over again against Moses. And they said, oh, how we wish to go back to Egypt, into slavery. So many times in our lives as well, we complain about this life, this road that we are on. We have returned from exile from the exile, from the slavery. And we are now in this life, in the walk with the Lord. And it's not easy. And so, so many times we too complain and complain and complain. And rather than keeping our eyes fixed on the promised land to come, that the promised land will come if we keep our eyes fixed and if we endure it's hard for us to do that. God is our Father. He guides us. We too have to live full of the hope of our immortality to come. And this passage that we have just heard from Jeremiah stresses the presence of the weak, the blind, and the lame, nursing and pregnant mothers among those returning from exile. It is the mention of the blind here that no doubt influenced the choice of this passage to match the healing of the blind Bartimaeus, which we will hear about in the Gospel for this coming Sunday. The responsorial psalm for this coming Sunday speaks so beautifully about that which, even though we may be in exile, has to be present in our lives. Even though we may be exiled from our true homeland, heaven, still the Lord is calling us to possess great joy in the midst of anything and everything that we go through. Look at the psalm for this coming weekend. The Lord has done great things for us. We are filled with joy. Let's repeat that. The Lord has done great things for us. We are filled with joy. When the Lord brought back the captives of Zion, we were like men dreaming. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with rejoicing. The Lord has done great things for us. We are filled with joy. Then they said among the nations, The Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, and we are glad indeed. The Lord has done great things for us. We are filled with joy. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like the torrents in the southern desert. Those that sow in tears shall reap rejoicing. The Lord has done great things for us. We are filled with joy. Although they go forth weeping, carrying the seed to be sown, they shall come back rejoicing, carrying their sheaves. The Lord has done great things for us. We are filled with joy. Where does our joy come from in the midst of our exile? In the midst of the fact that so many of us in this exile that we are in, life here on earth, so many of us are lame. So many of us are experiencing this or that blindness in our lives. Where does our joy come from? From the presence of the Lord in our lives. That's where our joy comes from, that God is with us. 
And then if God is with us, it's all going to be okay. Each and every Mass that we gather for, at each and every Mass, we celebrate taking bread and wine and the priest in the person of Jesus Christ, the priest taking the place of Jesus at Mass, blesses the bread and shares it with all of us. At each and every Mass, the priest takes the bread in his hands and pronounces these words, This is my body, which will be given up for you. This is my body, broken for you. Paul, in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul, teaches us that we are the body of Christ. We as believers, as followers of Jesus, we are the body of Christ. In other words, Christ has no hands but yours, no feet but yours, no eyes but yours, no mouth but yours. And as Paul teaches us, when I have become a follower of Christ, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. We are the body of Christ. This is illustrated so well to us by the experience of Paul himself, who at his conversion on the road to Damascus, Paul is blinded. He's unable to see. And Jesus comes and speaks to him. He speaks to Paul, this great persecutor of Christians. Paul spent his life killing Christians, persecuting Christians. And Jesus blinds him and speaks to him and says to him these words, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Why are you persecuting me? Who was he persecuting? Jesus had already ascended into heaven. He was no longer there, right? Who was Paul persecuting? He was persecuting the Christians. You see, Jesus is equating himself with you and I. We are him in the world. We are him. Now, we are the body of Christ. At Mass, we celebrate and we share the body of Christ, the body of Jesus, the bread, right? The priest takes the bread into his hands. First, at each and every Mass, we recount that Jesus took the bread in his hands, blessed it, Blessing means filling it with happiness. When you wish someone that they be blessed, when you say to someone, God bless you or bless you, you're wishing for them to have joy in their life. And so, Jesus takes the bread, blesses it, and then he breaks it, right? He breaks the bread. Jesus breaks the bread. It's broken. And then the priest pronounces the words that Jesus said, This is my body, broken for you, given up for you. This is my body. We are the body of Christ, which is why we are broken. That's why we are broken people, wounded people. Whatever brokenness you have in your life, you're always going to have. It may be in one form or the other. Whatever woundedness you have had inflicted to you in your life, it's part of life. There will always be brokenness in our lives, always woundedness in our lives. It's part of being alive, always. But Jesus, before he broke the bread, he blessed it, right? He blessed the bread, filled it with happiness, filled it with joy. You can be broken, you can be wounded. You may have been raped in the past, 
You may have cancer in your body. You may be depressed. You may have lost a loved one. You may not have a job. You may be facing foreclosure. Whatever brokenness you're experiencing, maybe you feel unloved. Maybe you can't seem to find a partner in this life for yourself. Whatever brokenness there is in you, you have problems with your marriage, problems with your children, problems with your parents, whatever problems there may be. Whatever brokenness there is, when you realize that you have Christ in you and that Christ has blessed you, He has filled you with happiness. He has filled you with joy. And you know where that joy comes from? Where is the bread? Where was the body? Where is the body? Where are you? At each and every Mass, we recount. Where is the bread before it is blessed and broken? It is in Jesus' hands. He's got you in His hands. And He will never let you go. So you may have cancer in your body, but I am in His hands. I may have marital issues, but I am in His hands. I may be depressed, but I am in His hands. I may have been raped, but I am in His hands. I may have people gossiping about me and making things up about me, but I am in His hands. I may not be able to find a job, but I am in His hands. My world may be caving in. But I am in his hands. I may be losing my home, but I am in his hands. Whatever issues. I may have addictions in my life that I'm battling, but I am in his hands. And if he's got me in his hands, he will never let me go. And I will be fine. That's what we have to learn walking in this life, the exile. Part of being exiled is suffering. Part of exile is problems. We have to learn that God in our lives doesn't come into our lives to fix us. God isn't about fixing you. God comes to accompany you, to be with you in the midst of your brokenness, in the midst of your woundedness. Think about this. After Jesus resurrected, He comes back, right? And appears to His followers. He appears to them. Every time He comes back, He comes back with His wounds exposed. Which is why Thomas says what? Unless I am able to touch his wounds, place my finger in the nail marks and in his side, I shall not believe. When Jesus comes back, he's always wounded in his appearances when he comes back. Some wounds in our life never heal. Jesus didn't. His wounds didn't heal. He came back wounded. What makes you think that your wounds will heal? heal. If his didn't, he was still bleeding. We all bleed in so many ways in our lives from all sorts of brokenness that has been inflicted on us in this life. We bleed. But you are not alone in this bleeding. There is somebody who is bleeding with you that loves you. His name is Jesus. He loves you so much that He is bleeding with you and for you. His heart bleeds alongside you when you are bleeding in this life. The woman who was hemorrhaging for 12 years that we meet in the Bible, she, the Bible tells us, went all over spending all of her money on all sorts of doctors trying to cure her hemorrhage. This is metaphorical, of course, in the Bible, right? Trying to tell us something that all of us will bleed in this life until we come to the only doctor 
that has the solution to our bleeding in this life. Jesus Christ. He is the only one. When she found him, her hemorrhage was over. The bleeding stopped. He gave her the healing that she was looking for. Oh, she went on having problems in her life, having wounds, having issues. But her healing came from knowing who it is that was with her throughout the course of her life. She came to Jesus. We are to do likewise. Come to Jesus. Only He has the solution. No one else. He satisfies. The world doesn't. Your things will never satisfy you. Your money will never satisfy you. Your gadgets will never satisfy you. The people in your life will never satisfy you. You know that. People, as much as you may think, are so devoted to you, one hour from the next they can turn and betray you. That's how it is in this life. You know that from your own experience. Even a mother, even a mother is capable of abandoning her own children. Even a mother can abandon her own children. But the Bible says, even mother, even though a mother can do that, God says, I will never abandon you. Ever. Ever. This is illustrated so well for me in my own life. Throughout my time in the seminary, I had these wonderful experiences of service. And in one of the places that I was sent to in the seminary was in the southern state of Mexico called Oaxaca. And there, while I was there, I helped out in a church. And as part of the ministry of that parish in the city, the parish had a team that would go out every single day to the local garbage dump where the poorest of the poor would go to try to salvage something that they could use in the garbage dump. And there, one day, the team came back to the parish. They had found a six-year-old girl there at the garbage dump who was abandoned there by her mother. And before we judge this mother, you don't know what she was going through in her life that made her leave her daughter there at the garbage dump. You don't know. Unless we walk in somebody else's shoes, we have no right to pass judgment on anyone. But she abandoned her daughter there, six-year-old daughter at the garbage dump. She abandoned her. They brought the girl to the parish and they left her there. And I said to her, why don't you wait here while I get somebody to come and help you? Obviously to take her to the local orphanage. It was run by nuns. And I said, you wait here. And while I went away, I placed a piece of bread, Mexican bread, in front of her. And a glass of milk. And I said, you wait here and drink your milk and eat your bread while I go out and try to find help. I came back after a while and I noticed that she had only eaten a little bit of her bread and only drank maybe this much of the milk in the cup that I'd placed in front of her. And I said to her, I thought you were hungry. Why didn't you finish your bread and drink your milk? And she looks at me and she says, I'm saving them for my mother who is going to come back for me. My mother is going to come back for me. 
My mother's coming back. I'm saving them for her. When needless to say, the mother never came back for her daughter. She ended up in the local orphanage. That mother never came back for her daughter. But God, our Father, in His Son, Jesus Christ, has come back for each and every one of us because He loves us and because He did not wish any of us, His children, to be lost. None of us. God has come back for us. God has come back for you because He loves you to rescue us from the garbage dump of our lives. The garbage dump of sinfulness, of despair, of whatever we may be inundated in. God has come back to lift us up from the garbage dump and to allow us to shine and to radiate with the joy of being His children, of always being in His hands, as broken as we may be as bleeding as we may be, as wounded as we may be, as full of problems as we may be, God has come back to rescue us, to give us new life, and to fill us with gladness. That you can have in this life when you allow Jesus to take over your life, to be your best friend, to be your companion. The friend that will never betray you, never abandon you, never leave you anywhere. That's always going to be there constantly with you. That's the joy that God offers to each and every one of us. Simply because He loves us. Just like we are. There's nothing you can do to make God love you more or less. God loves you just because, period. Just because you are you, God loves you and wishes the best life for you. Here, in exile. It's not just that we're focused that it's going to be happiness and bliss and joy in heaven. You can have happiness and joy and bliss here, right now. When you come to know that no matter what happens, you are with God and you are God's. And it's all going to be okay. You can make it. God's there to help. That's why we lift our heads up high when we walk high. Because we walk with God. Let us look at the second reading for this coming weekend, which speaks about who? Jesus Christ and all that He did for us. Jesus, the High Priest, the humble High Priest. A reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Brothers and sisters, every high priest is taken from among men and made their representative before God to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He is able to deal patiently with the ignorant and erring, for he himself is beset by weakness, and so for this reason must make sin offerings for himself as well as for the people. No one takes this honor upon himself, but only when God called him, just as Aaron was called. In the same way, it was not Christ who glorified himself in becoming high priest, but rather the one who said to him, You are my son, this day I have begotten you. Just as he says in another place, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. The word of the Lord. The book of Hebrews is the only book in the New Testament that presents to us Jesus as the high priest. The one who is able to mediate between us and God. Jesus who comes to show us how to live, to live with humility, 
Jesus has taken on everything and anything that we have done in our lives. He has paid the ransom, the price, so that we may end up in paradise with God. But Jesus was humble. He was humble. He, as the Bible tells us, did not deem equality with God something to be grasped, but rather he emptied himself, taking on the form of a slave, coming in human appearance. Jesus was humble, the humble high priest, and teaches us the same. Jesus wants us in humility to admit here and today that we need God, that we need Him to come and heal our blindness, that we need to change each and every one of us, all of us. We've got things in our life that we need to change, that need to change so that we may be able to radiate with that joy that He has come to fill us with in our lives. Those same words that were spoken to Jesus at His baptism were spoken at your baptism. When the heavens opened when you were baptized, and God, your Father, who loves you so much, looked down and said, You are my beloved son. You are my beloved daughter. With you I am well pleased. Make those words your own. As God every single day looks at you with eyes of love and says, You are my beloved son, my beloved daughter. With you I am well pleased. You see how soothing it is to know that. As the Bible proclaims, it's our balm. In other words, our ointment, our neosporin. <laughs> for our wounds. the great presence of God in our lives. What more do you want? See, the problem is with us is it's never enough. It's never enough. It's not enough that God is there with us, bearing it all with us, walking with us. We want more. We want to be fixed. We want quick solutions. We want a God who comes and arranges everything and grants us all, all that we want, not that we need, but all that we want like this. The Bible tells us God comes and answers all of our needs. In other words, whatever you need, you've got. Because God knows what you need before you ask Him. But it's not what we're looking for as people. See, we go to God and we, we want. We want Him to give us what we want, not what we need. God knows what we need, and whatever it is that we need has already been given to us because God loves us so much. All we have to do is just embrace that, realize it, and live it. That's the blindness that God comes to heal in our lives. The spiritual blindness of not being able to see how much God loves me and how much I need to change and be better. We don't seek to be better because we fear God and His punishment. That's not a reason to change because you're afraid of going to hell. That's not a reason to change. That's childish. You know why we should change and why you should seek to change your ways? Because you love God. When you love someone, you want to please them, right? We should seek to change our life because we have been loved 
we feel that love and we want to love God in return for the love that he showers us with on a daily basis. That's why we should seek to change, to please him, to become better, to rid our lives of whatever it is that is not allowing us to experience the joy that God has come to give us. That's why we should seek to change. God does not punish us. There's nothing that you have done in the past that God would punish you for. God doesn't punish us. Life in itself is punishment enough. Why would God need to punish us? Life is punishment enough of all that it deals us. God doesn't punish us because God loves us. It saddens God when we do not walk along the path of His ways, when we are far from Him. It saddens God. You know why? Because God desires us. God is after each and every one of us. God is seeking us. We know that from the Bible. Think about it. Abraham, did Abraham go after God seeking him? No. What about Moses? Did he go after God? No. What about the prophet Jeremiah? Oh, no. In fact, the prophet Jeremiah says, You have duped me, O Lord. And I allowed myself to be duped. You have duped me. And I allowed myself to be duped. What about Mary? Did she go after God? No, God went after her and chose her to be the mother of his son. And Joseph, where it's St. Joseph, husband of Mary Church, did he go after God? No. Paul, we just, you just heard his conversion story. It's God who went after him and the apostles as they were fishermen or members of other professions, God went after them as God went after Bartimaeus. Today, you will hear. And God is after each and every one of us. God is after you. You are not here because of you. You are here because God has brought you here, because God loves you, because He's after you. He has chosen you. And He has appointed you to bear great fruit. And in like manner, God is after each and every one of our family members. There is nothing you can say to convert anyone. God converts. God changes hearts. What we are to do is to pray and to hope and to know that just like God has brought us here, God in God's time, in His great love, will bring those around us to Him as well. That's the great hope we live with. That's the balm in our lives, the soothing ointment that fills us with all that we need to bear through whatever it is that comes our way in this life as we look at the gospel for this coming week from Mark chapter 10. As Jesus was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a sizable crowd, Bartimaeus a blind man, the son of Timaeus, sat by the roadside begging. On hearing that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have pity on me. And many rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he kept calling out all the more, Son of David, have pity on me. Jesus stepped and said, Call him. Jesus stopped and said, Call him. 
So they called the blind man, saying to him, Take courage, get up, Jesus is calling you. He threw aside his cloak, sprang up, and came to Jesus. Jesus said to him in reply, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man replied to him, Master, I want to see. Jesus told him, Go your way. Your faith has saved you. Immediately, he received his sight and followed him on the way. The Gospel of the Lord. During the time of Jesus, there were lots and lots of blind people. Lots of blind people were present all during the time of Jesus. Blindness was very common. And the Bible addresses here, through this particular story, spiritual blindness as the great human problem. Israel was supposed to be God's servant. Israel, again, the people of God, all of us. When I say Israel, I'm talking about all of us, not just Jews, okay? We are the new people of Israel. Israel was supposed to be God's servant, but was blind to the role God wanted them to fill. They were blind. As the Pharisees gained leadership, they became blind leaders. What does Jesus call them? He looks at them, at the Pharisees, and they were very religious people, observant Jews. And all of, I would venture to say most of us here tonight are very observant Catholics. We are Christians. We go to church, right? What did Jesus call them? Blind Pharisees. Were they blind physically? No, but they possessed spiritual blindness, like so many of us. Jesus came to reverse the situation, making it clear who had spiritual sight and who was spiritually blind. The problem is that the spiritually blind do not know they are blind. So many times we do not realize how blind we are. Unless somebody points it out. That's why God has sent me to Las Vegas. <laughs> I am convinced of that. Everything in life has a purpose. The fact that you're listening to these words is no coincidence. Everything is a God incident in our life. Everything. God has you here because God wants you to hear these words this evening. And when I preach or talk about these things, when I give a homily, or I'm also speaking to myself. All of us have blindness in our lives that needs cure, needs to be reversed. Blindness in biblical times was primarily caused by a water duct located beneath the eyelids, drying up. The water duct under the eyelids became dry and the eyelids became puffy and swollen, as did the eyeballs themselves. This kind of blindness was spread by flies and was aggravated by the hot desert sun <laughs> and desert sands. It was a highly contagious disease and the only way to contain it was to quarantine the people who had this dreaded blindness. In third world countries today, some of this disease called ophthalmic conjunctivitis is still present today where you see people with swollen red eyelids and swollen eyeballs. And so people who were blind during Jesus' time, 
were many times separated if they had this particular blindness caused by this disease. And the only thing they could do was beg because they were thrown out, ostracized from their community. They were like lepers on the outskirts of town and the way that they would receive sustenance for themselves, food, was people would drive by and throw it at them. Horrible way to live. The Jewish people of that era believed that when the Messiah came, the Messiah would heal blindness. That's why the prophet Isaiah said that the Messiah would heal many diseases. Remember what the prophet Isaiah says, the deaf will hear, the lame will walk, the lepers will be cleansed, and the blind would see again. That is why when John the Baptist says, I want to, I he says, John the Baptist says to his followers, you go and you ask this Jesus if he is the Messiah. Remember that? And what does Jesus say? Go and tell John the Baptist what's happening. The deaf hear, the blind can see, the lepers are cleansed, right? The poor have the good news preached to them. And so the people were awaiting this Messiah. Mark is trying to tell us something here. Jesus is the Messiah. He is the one who has come to heal us from our blindness. And just before Passion Week, this particular story occurs in Mark's Gospel. We are in Mark chapter 10. Before Jesus enters Jerusalem, this is right before his entry into Jerusalem. And what happens in Jerusalem? Holy Week, right? Jesus' passion. He goes through the way of the cross in Holy Week. This happens right before then. J Jesus heals blind Bartimaeus in Jericho. And this story symbolizes how Jesus healed both physical and spiritual blindness. The blind Bartimaeus is immediately preceded by the story of who? James and John. We heard about them yesterday, right? Okay. Who asked Jesus the same question. Do for us, as Bartimaeus asked, right? Do for, us, do for me, he says. Jesus asks James and John the same question that he asks of Bartimaeus. What is it that you want me to do for you, right? What is it that you... Jesus stopped and called him and said, What is it that you want me to do for you? But what does James and John answer? They want power. They want glory. You see why? Because James and John are spiritually blind people. And when the story is over, they are still blind. When this story is over of Bartimaeus, who is blind, Bartimaeus is able to see we are all followers of Jesus as James and John were. All of us. Just because you are a follower of Jesus doesn't mean that you are not spiritually blind. Doesn't mean that. Just because you've been baptized or because you go to church doesn't mean that you don't have things that need to be cured. They were apostles. James and John. That's why a lot of times in the church, just because you are an apostle, and the apostles today are bishops and successors of bishops, priests, just because you're a bishop or a priest, doesn't mean you don't have blindness to be cured from. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we know that very well. So here in this story, we have Bartimaeus, a blind beggar. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he begins to cry out, Jesus, son of David, have pity on me. Have mercy on me. Have mercy on me is that basic prayer found on the lips of all those who come to God with a sincere heart. 
That has to be our prayer as well. Have mercy on me. That's the first thing we say at Mass after the initial start of in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Have mercy on us, God. We want our blindness to be healed. And many rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried out all the more, have mercy on me. When people try to stop you, and sometimes the people who try to stop us are the bishops or the priests. Don't let them stop you from seeking Jesus. Don't let anybody stop you from going to Jesus and pleading, have mercy on me. Don't let anyone be a block in your road to going to Jesus and seeking his mercy. Lord, have mercy on me. I want my blindness healed. And Jesus stops and calls him and says, call him. And the same thing happens to all of us when we go to Jesus with a sincere heart. They called him and Jesus says what to him? Your faith has healed you. Take heart, get up. I am calling you. The same words are pronounced to all of us. Take heart, I am calling you. We all want, those of us who love God and who want God to come to us, we all want God to take notice that we are here. That is why Jesus says these precious words, take heart. Bartimaeus, who was down, take heart. How many of us are down and out? And life is all messed up for us, broken. Maybe we're at the bottom of our pit in life. We are here, we come to church to hear the voice of Jesus who looks at us and says the same thing. Take heart, get up, I am calling you. Throwing off his mantle, Bartimaeus sprang up and came to Jesus. And after he was healed, he immediately got up and followed Jesus. Immediately. You know what that word immediately means? Immediately grace like that grace is a gift from God when you come to Jesus and you ask him for his help immediately he gives you that help because he loves you he fills you with his grace in fact in the gospel of Mark that word immediately is present 22 times 22 times in the gospel of Mark now, the story that we have just heard about blindness reminds me of a story recounted in the book Space and Sight by Marius von Senden about the first people to undergo the first ever successful cataract surgery. You know what cataracts are. They blind you unless they're removed. As you get older, you get cataracts. Some people even when they're younger. And all the people interviewed for the book were blind from birth. And they recounted their experience on regaining their sight. Upon regaining their sight after their surgery, the patients were unable to judge distances. They walked around bumping into furniture and other things. The world turned out to be much bigger and tougher to navigate in than they thought. The world turned out to be infinitely more complex. Unable to cope with their newly found reality, many fell into deep depression. Some even committed suicide, the book tells us. Seeing themselves in a mirror, Many wished that they had never had the chance to look at themselves. They imagined something different. Many became terribly self-conscious about their appearance. Some even refused to ever go out in public. 
A distressed father of a young girl wrote that the girl walks around the house with her eyes closed and that she is never happier than when she pretends to be blind again. Oh, the nostalgia for when we were in Egypt. Mm -hmm. God cures us, takes us out of slavery. Oh, and how we wish to go back. How people dream about their past, thinking, oh, it was easier when I was not with the Lord. It'd be easier to sin than to live in the grace of God. It'd be easier, we wish. Oh, it was easier in Egypt. A 15-year-old boy exclaimed, I can't stand it anymore. If things are not altered, I'll tear my eyes out. Can you imagine that? After regaining your sight, tear your eyes out after being rescued from a life of total darkness. All of us have been rescued from the darkness and brought into the splendor of light at the liturgy of baptism, the big candle, the paschal candle, everybody has a candle, represents the light of Christ which enters our life. We have been rescued, and yet we prefer darkness so much. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Yet this is how we are as well, like this young boy. We prefer sin to the light of freedom, which is why we are unwilling to make the necessary changes in our life to live in the freedom of God's children. We have the attitude that it is too much to bear, too hard to be a follower of Jesus. It's too much to see. It's too hard, right? It's too hard. It would be better before. What is the attitude with so many people today? The church needs to change. The teachings of the church, they need to change. They need to adapt. The Bible needs to change, right? The church needs to change. Not me. Oh, no. The church. It's too hard to stay away from the loose life. There is more fun there. Oh, Egypt, right? God's commandments, we believe, are burdensome. And the Bible tells us otherwise. God's commandments are never burdensome. Never. It's too hard to stop drinking if you're an alcoholic, right? It's too hard to go to AA. You prefer that, right? It's too hard to go to confession if you haven't been in a while and admit you need to change, that you've done wrong. Oh, that's something that we did back in the 50s. <laughs> Vatican II got rid of that. Not the Vatican II I read. <laughs> read it in there. I want to, when, when people tell me, you know, that changed with Vatican II. Where is it? Show me. Because I've read the documents of Vatican II multiple times. It encourages us to seek the sacraments of the church, including confession. It's too hard to admit you've got issues and you need counseling. How hard it is for people to admit that, isn't it? That you, maybe you need to deal with things. You've got marital problems. Deal with it. It's too hard to admit that you are weak and that you need help. Oh, we like to pretend that we're so strong that, you know, we don't have, there's nothing wrong with us. We're so wonderful, you know. Oh, it's... And yet the Bible tells us something different. Jesus says, when I am weak, then I am strong. When I am weak, then I am strong. It's too hard to ask for forgiveness and to apologize for the wrong you have inflicted on your loved ones and friends and co-workers. How many of you have such a hard time saying you're sorry? Seeking forgiveness. Do it. It's liberating. In other words, you know what you need to do in order to be healed. you got a conscience. God speaks to you through your conscience. You know what it is that you have to do. 
Do it. Stop swimming in shallow waters. Get out into the deep. I remember when I was learning to swim, this was back in Poland, in a village not too far from where we lived, we had this lake where people would go to swim. And I was there with my parents and my brother, and I was learning to swim. And I'd be pretending that I was swimming in the shallow waters where there was a lot of mud. And I'd be like this, and I'd, and I'd go, Look, Mom, I'm swimming! I'm swimming! I wasn't swimming. I was mud crawling <laughs> in the mud. I wasn't swimming. Same thing happened in the life of Peter, didn't it? Peter was out fishing all night him and his companions. And Jesus comes on the scene, and they're all, oh, we've been fishing all night, and we haven't caught anything. All night we've been fishing. And Jesus says what? Put out into the deep. Get out from the shallow waters, and drop your nets into the deep waters. And Peter's unwilling to do that, because they've been fishing all night. And Jesus says, go out and put the nets out into the deep. And Peter says, well, I don't know, but at your command, at your word, at your word, we will do it. And he puts the nets out into the deep water. And what happens? They, there's so much fish that they catch that the nets are breaking. They can't contain the, the nets. The nets cannot contain the fish. In other words... Put out into the deep. Life is about taking risks. Put out into the deep. You got to take risks. You risk nothing, you gain nothing in life. You got to be challenged in life. If you are not challenged here, there's something wrong. Because if there's no challenge from the gospel in our life, if there's no challenge, there's no change. No challenge. No change. The gospel, Jesus is about challenging us. Conversion, total conversion, to become different people. In other words, down with the nets, and up come the fish. That's the miracle. The miracle of Jesus saying down with the nets to each and every one of us. It's so hard to admit we have been wrong. It's better not to know the reality, for you don't have to confront it then and face it head on. You can keep pretending all you want, but the only one you are fooling is yourself, for God knows you and God knows the real you. You can fool me, but you cannot fool God. Jesus called in today's Gospel Bartimaeus out of his darkness, and Jesus is calling you and me out of ours as well. Get up! What will you do, in other words? What will you do? The question is, to see or not to see? Like Shakespeare asks, right? To be or not to be? Tis the question. <laughs> to see or not to see? It's your choice. You can go on leading the miserable life you've been leading, or you can change. You can remain where you are stuck in the darkness, or you can take a risk. <sighs> Trying to live in the light. Get out of the familiar dark where all the edges are rounded off so that you will not hurt yourself. The devil is the one who says to you, Stay with what you know. Quit mud crawling. Start swimming. Is it fear that is keeping you in the dark? Are you willing to see? This means the good and the awful all around you and the people around you and the world around you and yourself. Are you willing to bruise your shins? Are you willing to get hurt? Are you willing to bruise your heart? If so, then Jesus says, Go on your way. 
Your faith has made you well. Faith is the guarantee of the things we cannot see. Faith is the belief in the unbelievable. Faith is the trust that all will be well, no matter what happens. All will be well and all will work out. For God loves us and God is with us. And if God is with us, who can be against us? As we pray this evening, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord Jesus, we come to you this evening acknowledging that we have been mud-crawling, Lord. We have been mud-crawling in this life for far too long because of our fears. Because we have feared to put out into the deep, to take the risk, Lord. And you are asking us to put out into the deep, to swim in the deep waters. The deep waters of your grace. Tonight, Lord, we come before you acknowledging that you are our Lord and Redeemer. The Lord of our lives. The King of our lives. And that we wish no one else to have possession of our life but you alone. No thing and no one. Only you to take possession of our life so that we may be yours always and at all times. For when you are with us, we know that we lack nothing. And tonight, Lord, we commit ourselves to working to cure our blindness. And we ask you here humbly, with great humility, for the grace to see. To see that you are with us that you love us, each and every one of us, just as we are, and that you want the best for us, and that the best is a life lived with you, away from sin and in the light of your embrace. We pray for this grace today and every day, Lord, as we glorify your name always saying, Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. And may the Lord be with you. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go in peace. Thank you for coming. God bless all of you. Thank you for being here. God bless you. We'll see you next week. Don't forget.